one. We'll just wait one more moment to let some people join us, but we're thrilled to have you with us today. And Andrew, did you want to share the slides? So we are getting started and I will share the slides here just a second. My, I see lots of kind of newish names mm -hmm. and some um, familiar names. Might you put in the chat where you're coming from? And if you feel like screen sharing your cam on camera, it'd be great to see you too. Also, if you want to drop in the chat, if this is your first time joining us for a webinar or if you've um, been with us before, again, we recognize some names and sometimes we don't always know where we recognize you from, <laughs> what kind of context we, we might have met you in. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's afternoon for me, but I'm not sure what time zone you're in. We have individuals here from all over the United States as well as the globe. So thrilled to have you all join us. I'm Dr. Megan Lippy. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, um, and I'm joined by my, my dear colleague, Dr. Andrew Davis from the University of Portland, an associate professor there. We are both co-investigators for the End of Life Nursing Education Consortium, specifically focusing on advancing palliative care education. Um, we do want to acknowledge our, our, we are thrilled to have Dr. Susan Meskis join us today, who is um, a, a shiny example of palliative care education. Um, we'll let her show you her, her uh, environmental context in a little bit. She is joining us from Alaska where it's very, very cold and snowy. Um, so before we dive into the content, I do want to briefly um, mention our, our sponsors for this. We do have funding um, not only through LNEC, but also through the Cambia Health Foundation that has provided funds to help us do our work of supporting palliative care education um, in, in many contexts. So we wanna thank them for their support of this webinar, all of our other webinars and the work that we do. So we'll go to the next slide, please. I just wanna really quickly yeah. say, um, it looks like some, we have at least one person signing on here from uh, Manila, Philippines. So that's pretty far. Good afternoon, good evening to you. Okay. Uh, those of you who've joined us before, this uh, you might be able to do this this part of the presentation just like we, but we we do like to ground our our time together in sort of the space or the information, I guess, that informs our work. One of the important documents that helps us to, to support the need for palliative care education uh, comes from a joint statement by the American Nurses Association and the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association. This call to action lead and transform palliative care. Next slide. And the first recommendation of that call to action is that uh, schools or academic and, or practice settings adopt the LNET curricula as the standard for primary palliative nursing education. And so not sure if that's what brought you here today or if there's other uh, ways you found your way to us, but a lot of what we ground our work in is that dating back even pre-essentials, pre-changes in our curricular standards in the United States, this statement was made. Also the caveat that this came out before we had our graduate curricula, but still the same sentiment that um, LNEC is a, a strong resource for palliative care education. Next slide. So those of you who might be new to LNEC, the End of Life Nursing Education Consortium, it was initially developed in 2000, and it started with the ELMA core curriculum. Uh, and the first course was delivered in 2001. And as you can see on the slide, we've had many, many, many iterations of different curricula. Um, and and I'm thrilled to share also, it's not on this slide, but LNET core in particular has been adopted in, in countries throughout the world. It's been uh, translated and culturally tailored to fit the needs and the practice uh, realities of nurses around the globe. And it's in uh, around a dozen, around 12, I don't, can't remember the exact number, but several countries. So we're thrilled to see the international impact as well. Next slide. 
So for schools of nursing based in the United States, again, we're thrilled to have our international colleagues join us. But for schools in the United States, the 2021 curricular standards are um, from the American Association of Colleges of Nursing came out and was a very exciting moment for us. Um, just so you know, when we're focusing today on LNEC undergraduate, we're really centering on that level one entry level nursing student. Yeah, next slide. And then, oop, whoa. The exciting piece that really got us, what um, we felt very seen at this moment was the naming of several spheres of care, one of which is hospice palliative supportive care, uh, which sort of transitioned this idea of preparing students to care for patients with serious illness or, or you know, this palliative care trajectory from a nice to know, or maybe if you have someone who likes it, maybe you teach it. This naming of this sphere has really made it where it's a need to know and you thread it across the curriculum and really amped up the expectations for preparing students to do this important work. Next slide. Also, um, the there are competence statements for, for undergraduate and graduate palliative care. Um, the original undergraduate statements we call CARES, they were published in 2016 um, and then have been updated in 2022, sort of after the new essentials came out. Um, so it's the second edition of CARES that has 15 competence statements. So if you're teaching in undergraduate programs and you're trying to envision what are those competence expectations for our students within the sphere of palliative care, we really encourage you to refer to those CARES statements that are found on the LNEC page. They're found on AACN's website as well. Um, we've done a lot of work to crosswalk that with the essentials uh, domains and uh, competencies, some competencies concepts. Um, there's also a GCARES, the graduate version of those competency statements for those of you who might teach graduate students as well. Next slide. Today, as we consider our module five of LNEC's undergraduate, new graduate curriculum, we wanna focus on two main objectives or two main competent statements, I should say, from CARES that specifically align with what you would find in that module. So CARE Statement 14 says that we expect students upon graduation to be able to support patients, families, and team members to cope with suffering, grief, loss, and bereavement. And number 15 says we would expect those entry-level nursing students to, upon entering practice, be able to implement self-care behaviors to cope with the experience of caring for seriously ill and dying patients and their families. And we'll see those ideas come up for us today as we spend some time exploring how we teach loss, grief, and bereavement to our undergraduate students. Um, Dr. Davis and I have done uh, some separate work, which was funded by the National League for Nursing um, to develop a competence assessment tool, which uh, really tries to look at behaviors we would observe of students that might indicate that they are developing competence. And in that, we have two domains. Um, one is lost grief bereavement, where we've identified two behaviors that we might be able to observe students doing. Um, and then uh, self-care and reflection, which has four behaviors. And those really align strongly with domain 10, um, the professionalism domain of the essentials. Next slide. We have been on a journey together throughout this calendar year, um, exploring all of our different LNEC undergraduate and graduate modules. So today is Lost Grief Bereavement. We will be concluding our undergraduate series in January with final hours. We don't have the date yet because Dr. Davis and I are waiting to make sure we know our teaching assignments for the, the spring semester. And once we know what days were available, we'll be posting those dates soon. Uh, LNAC has been growing. We always like to, to touch base with our, our community here together and share utilization to date. Um, so our LNIC undergraduate new graduate curriculum is being used in some capacity or has at least been accessed by 1,139 schools. And this was sort of our last check at the end of October. Um, and our graduate program continues to grow as well. And we're, we're closing, in, uh, closing in on that 400 mark, which is so exciting. 
All right. So that's the backdrop. And now we get to do the really exciting work. Uh, we do want to introduce um, those of you uh, to a little bit of our what our module looks like. We're not sure if you've seen it or not. Um, so we are going to introduce you. A couple things that I want to share before we open up the module. One is that any faculty at a school of nursing, um, I think we have a student here, so sorry, student, this isn't for students, but for faculty at schools of nursing, you can get free access to LNEC undergraduate. You email LNEC, so E-L-N-E-C at coh.org and ask for access and you can get it. So if you're wanting to check it out to see what this is about, it's free access to the modules, um, especially as you might be considering incorporation into your curriculum. The other thing we want to share is that as of September 2023, the new edition of LNEC Undergraduate has gone live which is very exciting. Dr. Davis and I uh, worked closely on this over the past year to ensure that um, we update, uh, we captured updates in palliative care practice, but also in thinking about our um, current sort of nursing climate and cultural context. Um, and then also considering the essentials, the especially the concepts that might be in there. So Lots of updates. If you've seen any of the recent LNIC uh, newsletters or even our recent uh, publication on the AACN Newswatch or Faculty Link, whichever one, uh, we did try to provide a summary of those updates that you might see in the modules. The other big thing is it looks different. It, the Relias Learning is the learning management system that uh, through which our, our courses are delivered for this online program. And so you'll see it has a very different layout. Um, and that's to, to respond to a lot of the feedback from users about usability and, and layout as well. Um, so we're very excited. If you have students who have already purchased this curricula, again, it's all six modules for 12 months of access. The way that this implementation or rollout works is if they have already opened or begun a module prior to the update, they will continue to have access to the older version because they'd already launched it. However, if they're in their queue, they had modules they had not yet accessed, they will get to in do the new versions. They'll have the updated version. So for this next few months, students might have a blend of, of the modules, but after the launch date of September 2nd, any new purchase will have the fully updated curriculum. So just wanted faculty to know kind of what to expect if you have some students who've purchased the modules. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Davis, who's gonna give us a, an introduction um, and a brief glimpse at this module. Thank you. So you should be able to see the module here on the screen now. And this is the newer uh, released version of the fifth module, Grief, Loss, Grief, and Bereavement. So we're not gonna go through the whole thing, but for those of you that um, may have not seen this before, it's a chance to just sort of get a look at the different um, components and the ways that the students interact with the module. And again, get your free token if you haven't, if you haven't looked at this and um, we can uh, put up at the very end the email for you to do that. So here is the very beginning of the module. And one of the things that's sort of new is this idea of a content warning you can see here on the screen. Um, there's sort of mixed feelings about or opinions, if you will, about the use of content warning. But at this point, um, we are recommending that we have that just to sort of ground students because it can be um, triggering, if you will, or reminding folks of experiences that they have had in their own lives. So uh, let's see if I can um, skip on down here to this section. So here's an example of one of the interactive um, components with terms, just understanding what the different the language. So what students need to do here um, is they have to click. I've already gone through the whole thing, so it's not going to do this for you. But if I hadn't, if I was just a student first time in here, it wouldn't let me move to the next slide until I opened all of these. So it's a way for you to be ensured that at least the, the students are opening these. 
So you just click on each one of these drop downs and they get kind of a definition of the difference between bereavement and mourning, for example. Um, and then there's a section here on different types of grief and the, the functionality is pretty much the same. Um, and then there's a place to do an understanding check. Oh, whoop, look at there, I already did it. <laughs> so um, I guess I can't go back and actually take the, there's a question. You that, can, it says take again. Oh, oh, right there, yep. yeah, there it is, okay. So um, here's what it looks like. So based on the information that they've just gone through um, is that here's the question that they get and let's just pick a wrong answer. And you see what happens when you, they get a little bit of information about why that's wrong and they can, um, I think go back and do it again. Uh, let's take a look now at, um, and just so you know, for these knowledge checks, the students, because Dr. Davis already had gotten it right, it allows her to continue, but it is developed so that students do have to answer it correctly before they are able to progress. So they do have to retake it. Um, and each of the wrong answers has different rationale for why that answer is wrong um, and may not necessarily cue them into what is the right answer. Uh, we want them to really be engaging and thinking on that, but they do have to get it right to progress. Thank you. So uh, I wanna go down here to grief assessment. So this one has lots of different components set up again, similarly for them to explore the different elements of grief assessment. And then there's again, another review. And I think let's just play, um, although I don't know how it's gonna, Oh, no, this isn't actually a video. Um, what do uh, grieving families want? So here is a little bit of information from the different perspectives on from the voices of um, patients and families. So let's see if we can, um, here's a care framework. Oh, I wanted to show this because it's, it's kind of a nice tool, um, something concrete students can use to look at how to communicate. So it's a, using the acronym CARE, and we won't go through the whole thing, but um, it's a way for them to have something tangible, um, which is what a lot of students want, right? They want to understand, what do I say? How do I say it? Um, and then let's look at uh, words that are helpful. This is another really helpful, like, what do I say? What do I, uh, what don't I say? And then there's another section here on words that are not helpful. Children's grief is another component um, of this module. And we'll share just a minute. This is, um, I don't know how the sound is gonna come across. So I'm not gonna play it for very long, but also embedded in these different modules are sort of testimonials from experts. And then there's also, I don't think in this vignette, um, I mean, this uh, module, there's actually a vignette of a sort of um, enacting something between a nurse and a patient, but those are also in the different modules. So we'll hear just for a second from- uh, I think one of the most important things in practicing pediatric palliative care is recognizing that care doesn't end at the time of death. We now know that it's equally as important to support families in their grieving process or in their time of bereavement after a child has died. So most of these, there's one video in here that's about five minutes long, I think, or maybe a little bit longer, but most of them are three to four minutes throughout. And then the last thing I want to show you is the effects on the nurse. So the thing that um, we, we really want to... Um, remind students is that they, as professionals, also experience grief and loss. And so uh, this section goes into differentiating um, the different types of grief and loss and moral distress and some of that language in here. And what to do, seeking help, strategies to prevent burnout, wellness and self-care. And there's a case study that um, is embedded here and then there is a conclusion. I think that's really pretty much all. Summary of the module and a conclusion statement. And that's how they go. And then once the student goes all the way through these, they take, there's a built-in um, quiz that they take and they need to get 80% um, to pass. And 
I know Megan, you'll probably want to chat a little bit about that whole 80% thing and how we, how we use that. If you, in terms of grading, if you use it in that way. Um, so I'm going to, um, hold your thought. Well, and actually go ahead and talk about that while I change, uh, screens. There. So, uh, every one of the modules does have a knowledge assessment at the end with a series of multiple choice questions. Um, we have developed a test bank that is much larger than the number of questions they are asked, which is important. Uh, the students have to achieve an 80% on that module um, or that knowledge assessment to earn their certificate of completion for the module. One thing that instructors um, sometimes wanna do is to give students the percent that they earned on the quiz or that knowledge assessment as a course grade, we really recommend against that because the way the platform is designed, once the students achieve an 80% or higher, they cannot access that knowledge assessment again to try to get to 100. Instead, we recommend that faculty just have students upload into your learning management system the completion certificate and, and then consider that as like a complete or an incomplete. Um, if they do not achieve that 80%, they do take it again. But again, we have more questions than they were asked. So they might see a whole new set of questions or different questions from their first assessment. Um, so they are, it's intended to encourage them to go back into the module if they skimmed it and didn't read it to go and actually spend some more time immersed in the content. Another couple of things is for the videos. Uh, we have locked those this time around, so they can't progress. They can't just click to the end. They do have to watch it. Now they can, if they can process the auditory speed of two times, they can speed it up, but they do have to, to listen to it. So I'm really trying to um, consider, you know, lots of ways to do knowledge checks and, and some accountability for our students as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. No, the, other, the only thing I would add is, and many of you here probably know this, that once all the modules are complete, they get a certificate of completion, which is a, a wonderful thing to add to their um, resume. Yes. Now, one thing is, um, uh, thank you. Um, sometimes students want to say they're LNEX certified. We also mm -hmm. have faculty who attend our LNEX summit. So I want to say they're certified. We don't certify um, students. Instead, they get a certificate of completion. So um, if you have students doing this curriculum, really encouraging them to use the language that they have completed the LNEC undergraduate curriculum or the training program, not certified. Certified is taking the test offered through the credentialing body that's outside of LNEC. So I uh, just wanna clarify that language too. Um, I do see in the chat, Dan asked about what percent uh, does that that number of utilizations represent? We haven't looked at that. That's a great question. Of so, uh, we'll have to get back to you on on if we actually were to convert that to a percentage of total graduate programs or undergrad. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll try to find that answer. That's great. Thanks, Megan. So um, we gave you a little bit of background of kind of what this whole project's like. We gave you a glimpse, a little drive by one of the the grief loss and bereavement module. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about um, kind of the why, and then we're going to hand it over to Susan to share some of the really cool things that she does in the classroom. And then we'll field questions um, that you might have um, and concerns that you have. So um, what do students say? They need more of this. Um, they have anxiety and fear around death and uh, they see faculty as one of the barriers. So um, we need to make sure that we feel grounded in providing this education and they feel unprepared to provide palliative care education. So they ask questions like this was from a study that was done by a couple of colleagues here at University of Portland. Um, what are things that we can say? We would like some solid tips to deal with when they're experiencing emotional difficulty. This next one I think is really important for all of us as educators, the LNAC modules are great, but then how do we unpack them as the faculty? I would get the most out of this if there was an engaging professor to discuss it. So turning in this, the certificate of completion or that they pass that, at an 80% threshold for a given module is great, but how then our challenge to all of ourselves and you is to then how do we take that and unpack that in the classroom? That's what Susan's gonna help us take a look at a little bit. 
Um, and so some other comments. And just, just to let you know that you'll get this slide deck at the end when um, afterwards um, Andrea will send it to you. So uh, this was um, sort of reinforcing some of the other um, slides from Lee and colleagues. Um, interestingly, in hindsight, at the end, they really recommended in terms of curriculum that these components of palliative care education were woven into their education, right? Um, sometimes people have um, an elective and that's great. Um, the other sort of challenge would then be to how do we make sure that all of our students get this? And again, back to the sphere of care and such, folks are taking a look at that. Like how are we providing this um, holistically and comprehensively to all of our students? Um, and then understanding the difference in their role versus other members of the palliative care team. So this is another look at um, one of the um, um, uh, domains of our competency assessment tool that th those four specific um, elements that come underneath the self-care piece. Um, and it's one of the ways that we can um, really take a look at, are we doing these things? Are we helping our students to gain these skills? Um, and now uh, a couple of quick slides around all the different ways that we can sort of lean into providing this education that's not purely didactic. And so here are some examples of different things that I have done, many of us have done before, and I share these these pictures, these are images from, I found them, Kathy Weber is the artist. She lost her husband to lymphoma. And I, in particular, you have used these images as another way to sort of like get into the material around grief, loss and bereavement and obviously got, have her permission to share these. Um, so I think, uh, and then one other last one is music. So there's this song by Peter Gabriel. And uh, when I open up this, this in a course, we maybe I play this song, um, I grieve to kind of set the stage. So those are a couple of little examples. And now I'm gonna just follow the lead and hand it over to Dr. Susan. Well, well real quick before we do that, Susan, I don't mean to cut you off, um, but uh, Nancy, I'm thrilled. You've got some great questions in the chat, um, kind of thinking some more implementation. Um, what I think might be helpful is, is let's see if the stuff Susan's, the information Susan shares, um, kind of elucidate some of that. And we will save time at the end for us to dialogue as a group. Uh, so please know we are seeing your, your questions and if others have thoughts about implementation or faculty considerations, please drop those in the chat and know we will make time to answer those. But yeah, it's now, a, hugely, you, a hugely important part of these webinars is a chance for us to collaborate and talk with each other. Susan. But I feel that excitement and that's great that people have questions and want to discover more. So. I just want to start off by saying thank you, Dr. Davis, Dr. Lippi, for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, it's always great to be around you and inspiring, absolutely, to want to do more. Um, I also think it's important that I give you a little bit of a background um, that I've been with LNEC for a little while in different places in my life. And we're talking 2004, I went to my first LNEC training. Um, and then I was actually on a team that went to India um, to actually um, teach um, palliative care in India, which was which was amazing. And it just showed me that this platform um, just can touch everyone across um, across the world. And um, it's actually my job to 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 make it fit that way because I've been through so many different backgrounds and um, that have led me to here. So um, I came up to Alaska as a travel nurse and had done a conference up here and realized um, that up here in the in the in the north here, um, there was a lack of education. And so I actually did my first conference up here, um, which led me to an invitation to come and join the team to teach at the University of Alaska. So um, in 2018, I started to teach there and was asked to do, um, and, and actually this information came from LNEC to start doing undergrad. And I was granted the opportunity to develop a, an elective for, um, for nurses. Um, for the nursing student undergrad. And so based on the undergraduate curriculum through Relias, um, I was able to bring this to the university and to our students 
Um, and then based uh, from the from there, then I've been developing and I feel like it keeps evolving into something a little bit different each semester. And I also think that there is um, opportunity still here. Um, the reaction I get from students after every semester I teach this is, why doesn't every student get this information? Because it is something that is lacking and is finally so exciting to see how um, LNEC is basically weaving itself through the curriculum so that we can prepare nurses to just do what we've always done just a little bit better and, and also to support our nurses. Um, one of the big goals I have is to um, be able to be supportive up here in Alaska because our university is, um, we actually serve 13 different areas throughout Alaska. So we also address um, the native culture. And um, we actually have a couple smaller schools that we are also supporting um, um, in their education for end of life. Um, so next slide. So I was asked to go ahead and look at this module. Um, to begin with was the loss, grief, um, and bereavement. But something that I have done from the beginning is one of the very first um, first assignments that my students have in my class. And, and it's just because, and I think the question was asked, like, do we ever find out where our students are? Is I, do, I ask them to write either a poem or they write a haiku or they write um, a letter to death. And so here are a few of like the inputs that I have from students. But what I what this does is sets it up for me as their faculty of what is it, where are people at in all of this? Is it something they've never experienced? Is it something that maybe it was close to them? Or, or is there some anger that I'm feeling that comes through here? And it kind of gives me an idea of where are my students um, from the beginning. So, you know, we're down the way with lost um, bereavement and um, grief, but at the beginning is where we need to start assessing as faculty of where our students are in this learning. Um, so that's something that I start off with. Um, the next slide <laughs> is, um, so I use Relias as the foundation. So they do, and, and just like um, Dr. Lippy said, I actually have them upload that they completed and it's a, that it's whether they did it or not, complete or incomplete as far as the modules but it's what do I do after the modules? And, and, and for each one of these, I feel like they need to live in the space of each of these modules. And so they, I have them over a two week period. So the first week they're doing their modules. And then the second week, I'm actually creating um, journal reflections, some, some assignments. Sometimes um, they're participating in something like um, if there's a conference that's end of life or some kind of, um, HPNA is a great place too that they can participate. So I always have in that second part something that they can do that actively gets them involved. And um, that's why like a reflection I just put here, like a general one is I want to hear more. I want them to dig a little bit deeper and describe their own loss or something. Sometimes they're not there. And so they're like, I've never lost anything. And then they figure out, oh, I had this patient that once um, or I, I as a student, um, I had this patient last week and they start talking. And what I like about that, it's another opportunity for a dress like, oh my goodness, here's one of my students who just went through something and I can go ahead and follow up with them on that. So a journal, journal reflection, we do that a lot at schools, right? But it's also um, really trying to get creative in what we do. Next slide, please. So one of their projects that I have them do is um, from the module. So this one, I, I picked out the ones that they did that 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 supported what we're talking about today with grief, loss, um, and bereavement. But I have them make a community flyer from what they are learning out of Relias. It's a great way for me to see like what what are they learning? What are they? How are they going to speak this right of what they learned? And um, the flyers that they they create are absolutely every time I'm like wow. They, this is beautiful. This is something I want them to share. And, and, and many times I, I encourage them, like wherever their um, community is, where they're at, to share what the flyer is that they have created. And therefore the information is also going out there. But they also, um, it's it's something that they hold in their heart that like, I did this. This is something that I um, created and it's important, it's gonna make an impact to others. And so this is one of my assignments that I have them is create a community flyer and it's based on um, 
what they've learned in the LNEC material. And I always have them, if this, there's a couple of these are like front and back and you're not seeing that, but they always, I always make sure they include LNEC because that's the important thing about this is as this information is going out is that they come, we, we bring this back to it, just like we'd have them reference anything else, right? Um, but this is, that's another important piece that I have them, whatever they have create that they include LNEC on the back of that. Next slide. So um, in person, which a lot of times, so we are in the midst of, Elnick is, especially up in Alaska, end of life care is a not a newer concept, but a more difficult concept to, to bring because we have um, lots of different cultures here and we even call them by different things, right? We say end of life, they say transition of life. Um, so there's a lot of learning for me to do, but like trying to get this into the education, there's been, it's been difficult, but slowly and surely I have other facts here like are you available that I have to, we're talking about death and dying, or we have to talk about communication for people at the bedside. And I always jump on that opportunity. And what I love about um, LNEC is there's always supplemental exercises that are available to us. And, and especially for something that is so um, personal, like grief and bereavement um, and loss in general, um, I, I try to capture that from the beginning of when I lecture because I want them to realize like we're going from this space to like this is about loss and this is about this is a, sun, a very um, personal um, experience when I you know and I, I go through kind of like what they said at the beginning how it says this is very sensitive material I tell them I give them that warning shot right that's what we talk about I give them that warning shot that this is a difficult conversation today but especially for this chapter I go through loss with students and I and I prep the faculty that I'm gonna I'm like I'm going to give them um, an exercise that some somebody might trigger be triggered and and so we talk about that but one of the ones i love is the loss exercise that you find through elnec um the personal loss um there's lots of different ones in there um that you can actually do if you're in person and then i usually follow it up with one of the self-care which is actually in you know one of the other chapters but i actually follow it up with a self-care um exercise as well next one so some of the things that, especially for this chapter, we have to con um, consider that it does trigger for some people. So I also, um, if it's not my, if they're not my students, I, I make sure that they know how to reach me if they want to talk about what they experienced during my lecture. Um, also the faculty that I talk to um, that are, I'm in their class, I ask them to be more available as well um, as they process it. Um, if a student does share something that I feel like, oh, that's very sensitive, or I've touched something in them, I reach out to them. I don't wait for them. I, I just thank them. I'll say, thank you so much for sharing that. It must have been really difficult. Um, I'm here if you'd like to talk about that more, or can you tell me more, right? So I might send a simple email, and every time I've sent that, I always have them follow up with me, and they want to talk about it. So it's not that it was the magic thing. It's just opening that door to help them process, okay? And you have to allow the students to process. So each chapter is that two weeks um, because I want them to process that information. And I also want them during, while they're doing their um, journals and reflect reflections and um, projects that they're bringing out information that they're learning, but that they're also okay. Um, and adapt to your audience. And I always like the opportunity when I do talk is that, so I have um, Native, um, Alaska Native um, students in my class. And I think that's always important um, to, to, be a, to be open to um, their traditions as well as to invite them to share so that as um, nurses and future nurses that we can all learn from them. And um, we have adapted and that's, that's the beauty of LNEC um, is that we've adapted to our audience up here in Alaska. And, and like I said, I always leave them with a self-care exercise, especially for this chapter as part of a process thing or one of the stone exercise that they have something that they can think about and hold on to when they leave. And so those were a few things that um, they that I do for this one, especially this chapter um, in my LNET curriculum. I think there's one more slide. There's a second. Oh, okay. Yes, that's it. So um, I am open to answer any questions. I think we're going to have an open forum here. Um, also, you're welcome to always contact me anytime if you have some questions. Thank you. Um, gosh, there were some things I wanted to like, those are some very cool things that you are doing. And 
I uh, was reminded of something, uh, just another idea, and then I'll just quit talking. Um, we're doing, in addition to the um, integrating the LNET curriculum, I think just as a review, you do two weeks, um, they work on it one week process, and then you kind of unpack things in a particular activity kind of thing. So that's an, as an elective. And so for schools that don't ha you know, have to weave it in, in other ways, um, you know, I'm wondering one idea would be maybe to have it be a, a homework assignment right before class to do the module and then use one class period, the next class period for that. Cause I, I'm thinking, gosh, I probably couldn't convince folks to let me have two weeks <laughs> in our chronic illness course, right? So that that was just one thought I had. Dr. Davis, I, I also feel like that's that's the start, especially I don't know where everybody's at, is this is as we're, it's a newer concept, right, to start weaving everything. And I mm -hmm. think as faculty that are already using the information, um, when there's an invitation, that's us showing them how to integrate it. So I, one of the, one of our professors actually that I've lectured for a couple times in his class, he's like, um, would you mind sending me your information? And I'm like, you are, this is my opportunity to say, here, you have all this available to you for LNET. And, and so he's using that and starting to weave it, but it's really taking a piece of it from mm -hmm. LNEC and from what I'm already teaching in the big elective and starting mm -hmm. to show it in the different classes. Gotcha. Yeah. Good idea. Um, Folks have questions, um, or did you see some already, Megan, that you want to come back to? Um, so I think, um, yeah, let's go back. Uh, so Nancy had a few questions. I'm just trying to make sure I find the first one. Um, and Nancy, we welcome you to open your mic if you'd yeah. rather just sort of share your questions that way. Um, the first one, do you explore each student's experience with death? The fear may be based on personal experiences. Um, and yeah, so, so Susan has showed some ways that we do that. Um, there are some other strategies that, that uh, Dr. Davis and I have used in other ways to take a, an anonymous check-in with students. Um, mm -hmm. There's some anonymous polling um, the, you know, applications you can use to just sort of see you as you're entering that space where students at, uh, maybe with their comfort level, they're, they're, how are they doing with their own loss and grief journey? So um, some students may not even be in a space where they want to share in a way where they have to put their name with it. And so they're, sometimes it's just a matter of even getting a sense of how's the class doing more collectively. The downside to that is if you have a student who's maybe responding in a way that shows they're at a pretty extreme state of distress, how do you find that? You know, you wouldn't necessarily know who that is, but you could encourage whoever that student mm -hmm. is to, to come seek help. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, uh, and again, recognizing we have uh, individuals from all over the globe with us today, but one of the things that I share a lot in my teaching is that in the United States, we, test, we tend to try to be death defying, and in so doing, we are death denying in a lot of ways. And so we don't always like to think about loss and grief. We don't talk about these things very often. Um, so I think it's about to sort of you know, almost normalizing that grief is part of life. Nancy, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think all, I think journaling is a wonderful idea, your other strategies as well. But one of the things that rather than sort of like, uh, this, these are my words, soft pedaling around the topic. Mm -hmm. I think if there are any kind of group discussions where students can help one another express their grief, either in small groups or some, where they really get comfortable in talking about it, no matter how painful it may be, that is, I think they need to probably experience some of that themselves before they can really expect to impart that to other people successfully. That was my one first question. The second was, I would be interested in hearing more about how faculty either facilitate or impede, you know, I mean, just their attitudinal uh, orientation. Thank you. So Nancy, I, I'd like to just add in there. So I, I was talking just from this section here, but we actually have um, created a couple of um, simulation um, opportunities for students to actually go through and actually we get actors if we're off campus or if we're in our sim space, we actually use, um, we use actors there too, just to get that opportunity for them to actually um, 
process and actually have some opportunities to use some of the LNEC information. So that's one way that I've been able to incorporate that um, into it. And we do have throughout the semester, not specifically for here, this one, um, have opportunities in my curriculum that I meet with students and it's optional. Um, and usually everybody shows up um, because they, they want this information. And that's where um, we breakout groups and things like that. Um, because we're such a huge um, university across Alaska, um, I teach it online right now. And then, like I said, other opportunities, they look a little bit different in the classroom, but I appreciate those questions and how that looks, because I think that's where we have to be creative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, Nancy, I wanted that uh, to maybe answer a little bit a uh, strategy that I have, am currently using, not so much for faculty, <laughs> um, but in a in an interdisciplinary elective that we so we have the we have the LNEC woven into all of our students get it at some point in their program. And um, Angela has a question about how that is um, being woven in. Um, but in addition to that, we have um, this elective going on and students have a, um, they get to pick a lay text, a lay book. They just written by a caregiver or a family member or a patient who has had some lived experience around this topic and they read it through the semester. And what I have noticed as I'm reading those journal reflections is there's this really beautiful uh, sort of natural weaving together of the material in the class with the stories from what they're reading. And we're not asking them to look at it in their from their perspective, but that's what's happening. Like these um, are avenues into self-exploration. And I think that absolutely helps position them a little bit differently um, and more comfortably around uh, these topics. So that's been a, a real interesting uh, experience. And we also just had them, they also as an assignment had to develop a death cafe and provide it to college students on campus. So if you're interested in hearing about that another time. You know, another, another thought that comes to mind when we think about what facilitates or is barriers to this. Um, and this for me is just something that's come up more recently. Um, is I think that it's okay for us to role model our own journeys with loss and grief. Now, as that's appropriate, right? Because everyone is in a different space with, with their life journeys and their own possible losses. But um, for me recently, I was, you know, asked to, to teach chronic neurologic, you know, conditions, which, you know, it's not our, I mean, there's a heavy theme of palliative care in the way I approach that content even. Um, but in one of the things that I use in that, I share this um, real short video from from a palliative care leader who was diagnosed with ALS and shares how he went from being a palliative care physician to a patient needing palliative care um, as a real nice sort of way to get students thinking about this. Well, uh, Dr. Curtis passed away a few months ago. Um, and so this time around, when it came to the video, I recognized I was not in a space where I could actually share that in the room with the students. And so I told students like in my own grief journey, this is not something I can, I can show today, but I want you to have the link. I want you to watch that. Um, so I think it's okay too, where it is appropriate for us to also role model that in some ways, right? Of how do we attend to our own needs when those things spring up for us? Because we never know when those grief triggers will find us. Um, now that doesn't mean to make it artificial or to, to force that. But for me, I actually had several students reach out after just sharing a how much they liked the video, which I was thrilled they watched it, but also how that was real poignant for them that, you know, it's this instead of a faculty being the sage on the stage, showing that we're human too, <laughs> or I was a, a human being in that moment. Um, so I think sometimes they, especially undergraduate students need to, to see some of that, right? That it is okay to be grieving in the various stages of things. So just something that came up recently. Other thoughts or other ideas? I mean, again, we welcome you to share as well. Um, yeah, what are what are your yeah. burning questions? And I don't know if um, Aiden is still on the call, but it'd be real. No, okay. No, so, I, I sent him a message oh, saying, okay. we talking about how to teach it tonight. He okay. said he's at a conference. I was like, you can go back to the okay. conference. So he's going to get the modules. <laughs> That's what he said. So, 
Um, Anybody have other questions? And also, you know, I've seen some things come through the chat just about module implementation. I mean, Andrew and I and, and Susan and Dan and others, I mean, we we use these and so we're happy to help answer bigger questions too, not maybe just about this module if you're in a space where you're considering this um, type of resource for your teaching. Do we see a day will this will be required? Um, I don't know that we, I mean, I'd love for us to make LNAC required. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things that we do acknowledge or recognize is the cost is $29 per student for 12 months access. And we recognize that some of our colleagues and some schools, there's a financial barrier to that. And so we we work with them to consider other ways they might be able to, to provide um, ELMIC curricula in a different way. Um, but we do appreciate that there's been this sort of at least in the United States, that accreditation, that curricular guidance to address palliative care and not as a one-off, but as a threaded concept. Now, there's other pieces to that with accreditation standards and how that's being addressed, but we've seen the needle move forward in a big way with the essentials. And, and so I think mm -hmm. part of why what we want to do is help people figure out what that looks like. Um, but I do think we're seeing, especially, you know, coming through the COVID-19 pandemic and seeing so many nurses struggling with loss and grief and moral distress and compassion fatigue and all these, these elements um, that I think there's sort of a recognition by many that there's a need to better prepare the workforce with some of these, these strategies or these coping tools or even just processing what is grief prior to entering those spaces. I think that I think it's probably important also to like remind folks that you know LNEC is um, is sort of endorsed as the the um, uh, strongest sort of standardized evidence based curriculum that that allows us to kind of have a common denominator for all of our students, but you know for accreditation purposes and the essentials and such you know, you, you have to do it somehow. <laughs> You're going to have to do it somehow um, at the next accreditation, I think. I mean, it, they haven't voted on that finally, where it's kind of open for voting right now. But um, this is, so we bring that forward, recognizing that schools might be doing really wonderful things other ways um, mm -hmm. without using the ELNET curriculum. But but it is a great vehicle and it's very organized and it is the gold standard. Um, and the thing about it is it's, especially as we're moving forward and it's starting to become a thread throughout, they have already given us um, LNEC, um, the path for that. So you don't have to struggle doing that, which is fantastic. And um, Nancy, I saw your message there about, can we repurpose this? Um, the general LNEC, like core or for adult, there's there's the LNET courses that are out there for nurses um, that is focused for that. Um, when you say repurpose, I, I end up finding myself in the school as well as um, on a unit sometimes doing some education. I feel like once you're down this road, um, people ask you more questions um, and you just start, it becomes part of your practice. And so then from that, you develop your own um, but the core is where that starts or with the adult and all the other different LNEC um, subcategories that we have. Right. And then um, I do think that um, we're already seeing that it's becoming part of that we need to, to um, help students with that fatigue, that compassion fatigue. That's what we're doing by setting them up early and in, in teaching this in class is how do you take care of yourself? How do you take care of your families? Yeah, so LNEC does have many curricula. Some um, we we offer twice a year summits where people can come and actually get trained as trainers. So train the trainer format, where we offer um, different for different of our different our tracks. Um, LNEC core, peds, geriatric, and critical care also have an online version through Relias. Um, but those have all been designed either for, you know, nurses who've been in practice for some time. There's also APRN courses designed for more advanced practice. I do see that there was a prior question um, about some, well, some tips on how we address compassion fatigue 
during students' clinical exposure. Can I add one little thought before we move to that um, to kind of build on what you're saying, Megan, that um, and I think it kind of goes back to Nancy's question um, around the faculty in particular. Those courses that Megan mentioned are really great to ground you as faculty if you're not feeling uh, that versed in the content. Um, and the the live summits that she mentioned, faculty that register get $100 off registration. That's all. Can, can one of you answer as well as for the curriculum for graduate nurses overseas? Yeah, I was typing in that. So we do have, um, mm. um, we do have the gra LNET graduate, uh, which is similar to graduate tailored um, online curriculum that could be used in those spaces um, internationally. But also we have colleagues in countries, uh, mm. most recently Mexico, but we have Japan and, and oh my gosh, many countries, Albania and um, all throughout the globe. We have passionate palliative care leaders who have, um, partnered with LNEC to take the core curriculum, translate it, but then culturally tailor it yes. for their their uh, for palliative care uh, in their in their country. So, for example, our colleagues in Mexico are like, well, we don't have Medicaid and Medicare, so all of those insurance considerations don't apply, and and the scope of practice for nurses in their country is quite different. So, really, they needed to. You know, while the the essential kind of concepts or a lot of that fundamental information stayed the same, they did need to tailor it. Um, so we do have colleagues um, in many different countries who've done that, and so it could be that there's an option for that as well. Yeah, and the, if I would just maybe Andrea knows a little bit. There may be a contact for you in the Philippines, in fact. Um, but I think this idea of I mean, we've got three minutes, so maybe lost two, maybe one. Um, this idea of compassion fatigue during clinical. I, mean, I think one of the things that's important is that um, we see students who, who are in uh, spaces of grief where they either are wit bearing witness to grief or they are experiencing a loss of a patient or they, they witness death. And so I think it's important for us as educators to be cued into what's going on with our students in the clinical setting. And if we're if we know that's going on, how might we pre-brief them? Or like we want you to be in this space, but how can you be in this space and remind them maybe of some of these these concepts they've learned, but then also debriefing with them um, and helping them think about as they leave that space, as they leave for the day, what's their plan? So not what's their immediate reaction, but how are you going to care for yourself today after you leave clinical? Um, and I think that sets up a tone for them that we would hope they emulate in their practice that when they, you know, okay, when I leave today, What's my practice to make sure that I'm um, attending to self? We also have in our final hours module, which is, is not this one, but we have, there's a great video about the pause where encouraging nurses um, and any healthcare provider to take one minute after a patient has died and just stand in silence and breathe and reflect to acknowledge that a patient's life has ended, a person's, you know, um, that patient has died. And then whatever that means for them from that, you know, for that person's beliefs and, and what happens after death, but just acknowledging and making and just taking that one minute um, has really been shown in some places to just sort of not avoid, but maybe mitigate a little bit some compassion fatigue because they're not moving right on to the next task. They're making some space. I wanted to before, oh, Andrea, just put it in. I wanted to just, we don't have, um, we're wrapping up here and I wanna say thank you to Dr. Meskis for sure. And to all of you for your questions and for being here and uh, we'll turn you to the faculty corner, which um, is in the chat. The link for that is there where there are lots of resources. Our contact is there, uh, past recordings are there um, and future webinar registrations are there. And again, you'll get these slides. Um, afterwards. So thank you all for being here. And, and uh, very excited to announce that LNIC Faculty Corner, as of like, what, a week or two ago, has a brand new look. Um, it, is, it is looking <laughs> a lot. I don't know, we got very jazzed about it. So if you haven't visited in like two weeks, you should go check it out because it's famous, <laughs> oh, just organized um, in a more aesthetically pleasing, I, I think, way. So great. Uh, we have regional chairs that may be from your area. Um, Dan is a chair for the islands. He's here. And Susan is for the island of Alaska. 
Um, but you maybe take a look on the website. It says regional chairs, find your regional chair here. And if you don't see, and that's just a, a contact within your region that is there to support advancing palliative care um, education near you um, or Megan and I are here for yeah. you. If there's not one, it's us. It's we us. want everyone to have a someone they can reach out to for support. So we are the big global region of chairs <laughs> where there's not been some chairs. So sign up for next month if you teach in the, or not next month, January. Happy yeah. holidays, yeah. everyone. We have New one year. in December. Oh, we do? Yeah, no. we're doing um, module five for the elementary. Oh, graduate. Classes. Yeah, that's final right. Final hours graduate. a combination of lost grief bereavement and final hours for our graduate curriculum. So we hope you'll join. And we want to <laughs> thank you all for joining today. Yes. Appreciate seeing so many new faces and, and faces we've seen before. So. Love to have those folks from the Philippines. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.